Good day, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us again in our Cyber Risk Governance live event in LinkedIn. And today we have a special guest. Yes, 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 yes. I know it's a little <laughs> bit technical. We'll, we'll jump into it. Yes, I know this. the title is a little salesy. Yes, I know. So we'll jump in and explain <laughs> all of that. I promise you, you'll get your answer. So let's, Sean, to introduce um, our guest today, our special guest. Yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to join for joining us at our Cyber Risk Governance Live event. We're pleased to have you join us as we discuss the journey we took uh, with a customer to elevate their cyber resilience and achieve what we think are impressive results. Our case study focused on a project with a glo global luxury hotel group where they had to meet uh, GDPR and Sarbanes-Oxley as well as ITL objectives. Uh, the uh, executives tasked us with helping their security team be more efficient eliminate alert, alert fatigue and improve detection and resolution times. All right, let's let's to, let's talk about Tim first. Let's introduce to meet our guest. <laughs> we implemented advanced security automation solutions and achieved the improvement in the MTTD and MTTR that they sought, which helped them save over six hundred thousand dollars over the next three years. Oh well, I will ask you that question, Sean. The results <laughs> were an over 86% improvement in the mean time to detection and nearly 80% improvement in resolution. The achievements highlight the importance of establishing cyber resilience strategy combined with continued measurement illustrated with trending analysis. I'm pleased to be joined by experts in the field, Stanley Lee, my business partner and CEO and founder of NetSwitch, who is trying to get me off topic, and Tim Malcovetter, CEO and co-founder of WireSpeed to share the insights and experiences in SOC operations, managed detection response, and the important KPIs in these areas. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Thank I'm you, gonna Tim. let you expand a little bit on your uh, background to let people understand that you have some sense of what you're talking about today. Oh, well, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I've been doing cyber stuff for 20 something years. I started out with hair, uh, and no gray in the beard. Uh, in fact, I couldn't even grow a beard. I think in the beginning, uh, <laughs> it so long. um, I've worked in, I like to say I've worked in everything from small startups to the world's largest company, Walmart, fortune one, um, and done a number of jobs. Uh, I've done all kinds of different security roles, been a general practitioner that like wore every single hat you can wear in cyber in one company. <laughs> Uh, I've been a software developer shipping features. Just that was my my one non cyber uh, stint. It was about a two year stint where we just did e commerce development, B two B. And but right now, like the last last couple jobs, I've built and ran a managed services um, department division at a company called Cideris, where we had three hundred uh, enterprise customers, pretty good size. Um, and then went and did some help. I ran strategy with NetSpy. So actually, I've been on this webinar before with you guys under that yep, role you have. But, yep and but what i'm doing now is what i've wanted to do for a while i needed to wait till everything the timing was right is launch a company called wirespeed which is a brand new take on managed detection and response we'll explain what the heck that is and why there needs to be a different approach to it and we'll, so. we'll touch on these these terms of response and resolution it's a bug yes. for me and stanley yes. uh, between res, between responding and resolving uh incidents so so where does this fit in as far as enhancing security monitoring? Uh, great question. So um, I, I, when I was doing, when I was at Walmart, I, I built and ran the red team there. And red teams, for people that don't know, it's the team of people that go and break in, right? And we <laughs> and, and did this for five years. Walmart's on five continents. Uh, there's They've ran out of every single IP address you could possibly run in the private. I mean, it's a huge, huge company. Did a lot of things there. And what I discovered really fast is there's a big difference between theoretical problems and actual problems. You can have a vulnerability in your in your attack surface someplace that can get exploited. But if you've got good response, you can see it and actually go squash the bad guy coming in on it. You're actually still fine. Right. You can actually still you can you can you know use that to prioritize what you need to go fix. And on the flip side, if you're a company that that does not have a detection and a response component, you don't really have a security program. You really don't. You're missing that. It's super, super critical. It's one thing to, to go and say, okay, I'm going to go get my posture set up right. I'm going to make sure all my vulnerabilities are fixed. But if nobody's watching, like you don't, how do you know that it's all working? And the answer is you don't. So 
monitoring is is uh, very near and dear to my heart. It, I, I like to tell people I've spent my entire career trying to get closer and closer to the most authentic parts of security as I possibly can. And detection and response to me is it, right? And Thanks, also that your, ties it into, yeah, I, I, you know me, I'm going to jump right in anyway. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that ties it into what we talked about from, you know, 2016, the first time that we, well, the first time managed detection respond provider cornered by Gartner. We all know mm -hmm. we love Gartner, right? Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> first time that when we got onto it, we were the first, I think, 12 vendors. Nest, which was one of the 12, we reference this as a pioneer. I already don't like that term. And to go back into what Sean had talked about, what Tim, we're going to dive deeper into it is, yeah, you know, great that somebody is telling me that I got, you know, I got hacked or I got alerts. And that's the respond part being MDR detection. Great. You know, and then now I'm going to give you an alert and telling you what's happening, but nobody going to resolve it. As we see that in the patch management, as simple right. as fundamental go back into my first day as an IT person, you know, patch management, something that I take very seriously. We all should be taking it very seriously, but then, then it ties it back into what you talk about, the monitoring, the measure and the performance monitoring. Well, are we doing all those patch management? And that ties in into what I refer, what we refer as resolution. And of course, we're going to go deeper into this. How do we using data analytic? It might not be able to talk about it all in, within in one hour. So now I'm going to jump back a little bit, go back into the title. You know, so Sean, why $655,000 in three years? And how does that tie it into what, Tim, you are, you know, you started this new company called Wirespeed and I love it. And, you know, it's very excited that I get to be one of the first partner. And, you know, it, frankly, I've always been in the, Nest, which has always been the leading edge on a lot of technology solutions. Mm -hmm. We tried and failed a lot, and but that's part <laughs> of our journey. It's part of our process, right? Keep trying mm -hmm. and finding the right tool. And what I keep saying is the balance. How do you find the balance between technical and the business objective? And our business objective is governance, risk, and compliance. And how we tethering that and how we get into the cost justification. And now I'm going to let Sean to talk about how we backing up our title with 655,000 yeah. in three years. <laughs> it was about using uh, the advanced automation tools that were available at the time and really being able to show them how those tools can be configured and refined with understanding SOC operations uh, to then sort of automate a lot of the things that they would have had a SOC analyst doing. And we were able to show them how they could improve the efficiency of their team by knowing in advance certain things that were going on uh, as to how to resolve them. How to, how to solve those problems that were being identified. Not everything that comes into a SOC is a cyber incident. And there's a difference oh. between events and incidents. Right, Tim? Oh, very much. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. and so what we were able to do is by helping them understand how to use these tools, helping them fine tune the tools properly, they were able to then not have to find a full-time employee and there was a calculation on those of how many full-time employees that they would need over the next number of years for this global operation. They had global response. Uh, they had global responsibilities that they had to meet certain compliance standards for. And they knew that there were things in legislation that were only going to make it more difficult. They had a location in California. They knew that eventually that was going to become an issue as well, which it has. And so they needed to be aware of these things of how to, meet those requirements and be cost efficient because that's what the stakeholders, the shareholders wanted out of the organization. So Tim, you were holding up some fingers there and I know you Seven weren't saying hi. Yeah, let, let me just no. give one comment yeah. tied it up into also in our title to 87% and go back into the yeah. processes, right? It's not just the tool that we use is to help us to streamline the process to make it operational effective. But it's also part of our mandate at that point. And don't forget, that was 2015. 
when we did this engagement process and then went into 2016 and 17. And that's right. why, you know, Gartner Con gave, put us into one of the pioneer and the MDR you know, provider. Right. Uh, I didn't really care about the title itself. I, and what we care is about <laughs> the customer's reputations. It was, you know, that was the biggest demand. It's like, you know what? Yes, of course, we got to balance it with the money part, with the budget, just like everything else. You know, there is no infinite resource that we can deploy. Right. But what kind of tool sets, what kind of process that, that the, our customer can enhance based on the budget allocations and then deploy that and execute it? And then in that, because of the combinations of both things, which I'm going to need Tim's to explain more about the technical side. And Sean, you know, you went through with that process with our client. It was really how we reduce it to the 87 is just to having that combinations of both technology solutions plus operational effectiveness in the processes right. to identify what we already at that point know the unknown, right? So we already talked about it for years, yeah. knowing what you don't know. And in not, not all the time, you know, Tim might hate me for it because, you know, not necessarily <laughs> the tool can fix everything, right, Tim? You know, this is why I, we, we're asking you to come back and talk about it. Let's face it, no matter how good AI would be, there's going to be flaw into it. It's just that what is the level of professionalism that we're going to look in into it or what kind of operation effectiveness that the you know, high level demanding the team to look at those you know, KPIs to determine what other things can be done. And some of it, what we did, how we achieved 87% was basically a better management in the processes and the procedures and we if we there are missing pieces we put the policy together and tighten up the procedures and i keep saying that for the audience that knows you know when i talk to them it administrators are the biggest corporal because we have all the tools and we have all the toys that we get to play with and a lot of times that we've forgotten about tidying up our toys chest is all over the floor. <laughs> you know, if the parents doesn't come in and give us, you know, the, you know, hey, take a picture, look at what you did, look at all the mess you have done. Well, then all those toys will continue to be laying around in the room forever. So that's kind of how we you know, balance it between the tools and the business processes to make it more efficient, to make it more effective. And ultimately that leads into the cost efficiency, what we've been talking about. So this is now, I hope that answers the title, <laughs> why that amount of money. And I know that ties in into Tim's, you know, the seven. So of course I'm gonna let him to talk a little bit more about what that seven means um to justify cost justification and the efficiency part so tim take it away and sean please yeah yeah so seven so um manage you know so if you're going to go uh monitor your environment but my my video just completely froze up look at that there, there you go on. oh and we're back, back. okay my video froze for a split second sorry about that <laughs> um so if you're if you're looking at um bringing security operations in-house and you're going to do your own monitoring uh, you start thinking about i need at least one person on every single shift 24 hours a day seven days a week holidays pto sick time all the rest the magic number is seven seven ftes to do that right um i'm gonna i'm gonna spitball and use some un unrealistic numbers if you're just thinking about salaries if you're but it's nice even numbers let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars a year per employee you're probably not going to find that for you're going to you might be able to find some juniors at that rate you're going to find some seniors that you're going to need to supervise them at a much higher what rate, about right? ai tim AI yeah well i'm not gonna, we'll get there we'll get there so <laughs> if if you assume that, that's seven hundred thousand dollars a year right so managed security companies started creating uh you know you know virtual security operations center virtual SOC services to address this because they say like you know rather than you do it in fact actually i'm old enough we talked about starting careers i'm old enough to remember that back in the day if you your, your infrastructure was just servers that you bought we would buy these little like you're going to split up a new application you go buy a new one new pizza box server and slide it in the rack and then what happened they'd sit there and they would be underutilized 
right? They, you'd buy this expensive server and you'd use 4% of the CPU. And so then we said, okay, well, let's go do virtualization. That was the next evolution of this. Let's bring virtualization in and I can have one really beefy box. It's actually running like 25, 30 different servers and the utilization now can be 70, 80%. It's more efficient, better use of money. That's really what managed SOC was, right? It's bringing this concept of I'm the hypervisor. I'm like this virtualized thing and I can now run this. And so uh, here's what's good about that. You have a bad day. You might need your one guy to look at four or five things at once. And guess what? That's a bad, bad day. You can't do that. Now, if I've got a team that's that's sitting in this giant pool, I can go do that. So, and it's it's almost kind of like the evolution to cloud, because now with cloud compute, what happens? It's elastic. So I can have like seasonal business and demand, and I can spin up and use a bunch of compute. And then when that demand's done, I can go back down to my lower level. Same thing. I could have a really bad day, really bad incident. I could have a bunch of humans helping out, back down to a good level. That's the next evolution where this went. What WireSpeed's doing is taking this even one step further in that we are automating the thought process of a human. So when I was teaching security analysts, we bring them on board and we train them, we'd say, okay, if you see X as a, as a like whatever this is, whatever X is, you see this ca characteristic about an alert, you tell a customer about it because it's bad. If you see Y, the opposite of X, right? It's fine. You don't, you can dismiss it. We don't need to bother the customer. And they go, oh, okay. And they start jotting this down. And then I, and I realized it was kind of like, um, I did joke I always tell, it's kind of like playing Super Mario Brothers back in the 1980s. You beat a level and you see a little bit of that map that comes in of you and you beat the next level and a little bit more map. And, a little, and it's like, I'm taking them on this journey to uncover the map, but I already know the map. So why don't we just take the map and let's write it as software and we're gonna actually have it execute all of the same decisions that the, the the human analyst will do. And that's ultimately what we did. And so by doing that, guess what? The most expensive part of running a managed SOC or any SOC is that human component. So now I can re run this all the way down. And we have customers today that are using us without a human in the loop, uh, without a human watching in individual cases and disposing and ver you know handling verdicts on individual cases. And that's where the cost savings come in. You still get the automation of the response. You still get the escalation. But you get it with that that expertise in a verdict as if a human was there because it's human curated. And then what we just did is we took the human and we put them into a quality assurance role and the, to QA the entire process to make sure it stays on the rails and has the fidelity and the accuracy that you want. And it's measurable and it's repeatable. OK, so let's take a pause and, and, and yeah. digest it into human terms, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and what I refer as part of the augmented intelligence, I keep saying from, you know, long before is not artificial intelligence that we need to focus on is really the, I, I call it the other AI. Of course, we know the official term is called RAG, but I don't want to throw another acronym into it. <laughs> For those people who don't know what RAG it is, Retrieval Augmented Generation, which is adding the human aspect into the mm -hmm. you know artificial intelligence into the LLM process, right? And so I just call it the other AI, Augmented Intelligence. So that is part of my you know, our development platform working on this augmented intelligence based on the LLM, all of that kind of fun things that we have to talk about because my marketing director told me that. So otherwise <laughs> nobody wants to be listening to our podcast or live event anymore. So AI, here it is. And so Tim, please add on it in the future time um, well, in this. Yeah. But one other element, go back into what you're talking about to bring it back into more human terms. I just talked to one of my mentees, got into as a cybersecurity analyst in Italy. So first time that he got into this job, into cybersecurity, you know, he was a chef prior to that. So very proud, brought him in from a chef, become a cybersecurity analyst as my mentee. So, and then all the way over in Italy. So that's kind of fabulous, right? So what he just told me on Saturday was like, he said, Stanley, you know that when I first got in, I handled 10 tickets. And I have to learn seven different tools. Interesting enough, you're talking about seven FTE. And now he, one guy new into the industry have to learn seven tools in the SOC to manage his job. Mm -hmm. And that was a challenge. But now six months later, he was able to handle 200 tickets or alerts a day. Mm -hmm. But then he started telling me, it's like, you know, I don't know what to do anymore because now I'm looking at all those things. It becomes very repetitive. I still have to manage seven tools. There's that fatigue Tim, we talked about. Yeah, yeah. And how does that 
going to be working with your platform based on your experience. I don't want to talk about too much into yeah. your platform particularly, yeah. but how does that augmented intelligence aspect of things can help with our poor soul that try to get into the industry. <laughs> Once they got in into the industry, they got bombarded by tools, by processes, by the number of alerts. Yeah, and that this is where they get burnout, and this is where you know um, really great. Some of the best people I've ever worked with have been spent time as a stock analyst and done this kind of work. Um, but it is high burnout rate. Um, I can recall back in my time when we were at Walmart. One of the things I thought was really fascinating about them being a really big company is they never planned on somebody being in that role more than two years. Like they, at the at the twelve month po uh, point in your career, they use it as an onboarding. They bring in new people all the time. Like, yep, go run a stint through here because you see everything and you learn fast. Right? It's kind of feet to the fire. But they always expected at the one year to eighteen month point, they start having career discussions with you about what else do you like, so we can retain you, and so you don't just leave and but they move them to other roles. And so it became a farm operation for them. Um, and I know other companies do things that are similar to that. But what we want to see is the humans doing the higher order things. So there are, there are types of, if you really love this kind of work, there are things that you can do besides sit and stare at a queue and watch the next <laughs> alert and just go swipe left or right on it all day long. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it bad? That stuff is numbing. Um, and it's just the, the silly little things that can happen with it too are, uh, my kid was up sick last night, so I didn't get much sleep. So I'm in a wrong state of mind and I, and I made an absent minded decision. I didn't realize I was doing that. And you have an error and then you have maybe an incident as a result because you dismiss something you shouldn't, or, or maybe you escalated, you shouldn't, you know, same thing. Um, so you can have that kind of a problem. Um, you also have air traffic controller level stress in that kind of a job. There's a ton of respect for people to do it because even if even if it's not your company, like if you're doing it for a big company and they can afford to do it, you're like, man, you, you feel like you're the guy out in the, on the castle wall protecting the, from the barbarians coming in. And if you mess up, then they're, they're coming in and the castle gets done. When you're working for the, the outsource stock, you've got that same concept, except for now it's like it's 5,000 castles, right? And you're, you're worried like I've got all these airplanes in the sky. I got to land them. I don't know which ones are good or bad or on fire. I got to figure this out. And you have just a few seconds sometimes to look at a case and go, this is good or bad. I got to get to the next one. I got to get to the next one. I get to the next one. Mm -hmm. And that's what we decided like, hey, this is this is not a place for a human. It's not it's not a good place. It's not a good human condition. We want to uh, give them all of the curated information about, hey, this is now highly likely very bad. And because we the way we do it, we also loop in potentially the victim user too, because that's the other problem. One of the dirty little secrets we found is that people that do this work are introverts. And as introverts, they don't want to reach out and talk to people who are potentially the victims or involved in these cases because that's, you know, anxiety for them to reach out and actually talk to them on the phone or whatever. So we built interactions. We have chat ops interactions that goes and do this for them because we know they're not going to. And what we've since learned, having built this, and I, I don't even know if I've told you this or not, Stanley and Sean, but we actually have customers that it, we see them experiencing that same anxiety on the other end. So we go, we take the alerts, we decide what's good. And, you know, it's like maybe 1% of all the noise is actually going to come to you. And when you get that and it says, hey, you need to go talk to Jane Doe and ask her if she really logged in from Jamaica. And you're like, oh, man. I've got 16 things to do today. This is now seven. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Right. I don't want to talk to Jane Doe. I don't know. Like, and it's just, it's anxiety. And so what we saw is people would sit on these cases for three days. Like you might have a threat actor in your environment for three days. And you're like, oh yeah, but I uh, uh, stammer. And it was like, oh, I've seen this introversion before, but I was expecting it to be on this side. Wow. So now we built it on the other side too. So it's like, okay, we can go reach out directly to Jane Doe. And by the way, and I tell this story all the time. I, I, the inspiration for this is I got from my credit card company. My wife and I go on a uh, go on a trip, and we go load up the Starbucks gift card, twenty five dollars. And I've got a lot of kids, so we're driving for a little bit. We have to stop at another Starbucks and do another twenty five dollar <laughs> transaction. And what happens? Capital One goes text email. Did you mean to double double transact at Starbucks today? And I'm like, oh, that's kind of nice. But if a credit card company can do this, and there's all this fraud around credit card transactions and phishing and things like that but if they can do it safely where they get that signal back whether or not that's really you or not then surely like a, a security cybersecurity people can do this too so we reach out and say hey jane we saw you just log in from jamaica is that you and if jane says no guess what we 
we just say, hey, I'm not going to send this back over to Stanley on the help desk because right. Stanley's going to look at this and go, I don't want to talk to Jane and reset her password. I'm like, uh, I'm going to go do I'm going to go change the battery for the in the mouse for the CEO. <laughs> right. I'd rather go do that than go actually take care of something that might be a, that is now a known risk, right? So yeah. what we do instead is we just guide the, the user through the re, the reset. We kill all the sessions. We, we kill the credentials and we guide them through recovery so that there's not pressure on the help desk. There's not pressure on the security team, and there's not an introvert somewhere in the in the in the chain going, uh, I don't want to do the next step. Uh, and so that's like that's how we're moving the needle. And what's funny is we say response because that's what MDR the category is. But Stanley, your definition of of, of response or, or uh, resolution, oh, resolution is very much yeah. in line with the way we see the world, right? right? It's it's to us, it's not it's not a proper response if you only halfway do it. Well, and that's part of the adaptive strategy that we have taken on. And when you talk about anxiety, my anxiety comes in is fear of missing out. What mm -hmm. is my operation is missing to get to the resolutions? And that is going from changing our positioning from, you know, even from a preventive and preventive, this is what you do coming in with the tools that help us to do our job. So we can adapt into the environment, not just on the human aspect of things, but on the more importantly is governance, risk and compliance, mm -hmm. right? And that is the other aspect, of, you know, when we talk to the subject matter expertise and different compliance, regulatory issues, that is where, you know, Tim, you're talking about losing hair, growing beer, and I call that wisdom. This is the years of experience that we gain, you know, the wisdom that we gain. That's why, you know, I got not much left. I'm glad I still got a little bit. But anyway, this is the part that becomes more adaptive. And I think that's what, you know, Sean asked my customers for, you know, over a decade and a half. And that's why he went into the dark side, I call it. Now I pulled him <laughs> into the dark side because now we have to be having that anxiety all the time to reflect what we do on a daily basis, not just looking at the number of alerts. And that is why the automation comes in. You know, I, I, as we know, you know, the technology will, technologies will continue to evolve and that would only get better and better. But also that a lot of company have the legacy system that for mm -hmm. one reason or another that they cannot change or they don't want to change or the old processes that they always have in place. Well, because that is human nature as well. You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. hey, we get comfortable with it. You know, just leave it at that. If it is not broken, don't fix it. But the problem is now it's already broken. They just don't know about it, right? So this is the part that where, you know, Sean and I keep talking about this all day long and he picks, you know, he, he picks bone out of an egg for me because, you know, then that's what he does and that's why I love him about it. So Sean, I, I'm sure that you have some comment about this you know, and how to tie that into the operation that how you handle our customers on a daily basis. Yeah, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking back to an incident when I was a customer and the SOC over in Asia had picked up some alerts on our network here in the States and they were trying to contact me at two o'clock in the morning. Now, I had my phone on do not disturb because I'm asleep. Yeah. And you know, that even blocked your call, Stanley, because they call ended up calling you saying, Hey, you try to get a hold of him. Uh, but the systems were crashing. They couldn't figure out why the systems were crashing. And you know, the anxiety that they had because they couldn't figure out what was going on, they couldn't get the customer on the phone, and really kind of automation. Uh, solves a lot of those problems, Tim. Like you were saying, the automation can alleviate that anxiety because the system is predefined to do things for them. And, you know, they ended up over the next couple of hours bringing everything down safely instead of crashing and having to rebuild everything after the fact. So, you know, with our customers, it really becomes um, a, a conversation of costs and where they're going to put the resources. Many times mm -hmm. they don't have the internal resources to run an internal SOC, mm -hmm. and they don't have the resources to go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, to your point, Tim, seven SOC analysts. Mm -hmm. And even if you outsource that at a fraction of what you would inter internalize as a cost, they can't even afford the external, uh, you know, contracting out those kind of services. And so the automation, um, 
is really a where would the conversation re revolves around how can we cost effectively uh, provide these kinds of services in a way that makes sense to the executives who have to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and also tied into that, Sean, don't forget that the Oxford University had done a research and, yeah. and this is the, you know, 72% of the CEO are undecided what to do with cybersecurity. Why is that? You know, take, I'm, I'm sure that in our they, audience, they're afraid to make a decision. Expensive. You know, it's deer in the headlights. 72% of CEOs are deer in the headlights. But they to spend make a millions in cybersecurity. And, and these are billion dollar companies. They spend millions and if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into their SOC, into the whole MDL process, you know, manage detection and response. Well, of course, why are they still now all of a sudden that they said, well, you know what, I don't want to invest well, at least 72%. I don't understand and I don't know how to make a decision. And that ties in, of course, Tim, you know, on the technical side, you have sat on that chair before as one of the executives. What is, you know, what is your recommendation and resolution to tie this to, you know, what Sean had just talked about, the processes and these to the decision-making process and, and help the decision-maker with the type of, technology or process that you based on your experience yeah sounds like uh they have the same anxiety that the sock analyst has it's their traffic controller but it's like probably at the billion dollar level right and it's the, the plane is the is the company and what well, ties into it. sean's talking about money in their case is all yeah. about the budgeting yeah. well not yeah. all about budgeting but the grc and money in in that i mean there's what happens there's a million things a million kinds of risk that can, can that can detract your mission of going i mean some of it's cyber risk some of it's just you know like air and emission kind of stuff or or whatever there's always going to be risk and you have certain risk you want to just you, obviously you need to have in play otherwise if you're too risk averse you're not growing you're not you're not gonna you know be a, a good business um i think for a, for a lot of people that i've seen there is also this fear of how much is not not just the the capital to go buy a license or buy an agreement. It's also the time. Like, what's it going to take to actually set this up? Is it going to be a distraction? Is it going right. to take, is it going to suck up a piece of their time? Like, what is that impact? And that's the reason why, uh, I mean, I've spent a long time thinking about trust and adoption uh, because uh, those and are the two verified. things. That, yeah. And yeah, trust and verify. And I, that's really what it is, right? You, you, in order to trust it, I, I we literally give away free trials. Like, you don't get that out of most oh, don't software. give that away, you know, so now that you give it. <laughs> so please, yeah. if you are listening, if you're interested to try it, contact us and we'll yeah. set you up with the conversation with Tim and his partner and, you know, try the tool. I was going to give that away at the end. Sorry, Tim. family. I mean, that. But the, reason why, the reason why we do that is because we want people to see how painless it is. Uh, in, we, we spent a long time trying to make the integrations as streamlined as possible. It's You can be up and running in just a few minutes with the right access and the right, right people. It's not hard. Uh, we want that to be pretty straightforward. And then we also put a ton of thought into, like going back to this concept of resolution, I'm going to use your word instead of mine. Um, it, to get true resolution on a case I and, and to do it quickly, because obviously if I resolve a problem uh, relating from a security alert, but I do it in a month and that an attacker needed, you know, eight hours to, to get to whatever it was to deploy ransomware in my company, I fail, right? Obviously, it's really, really bad. That's bad. If I get to it in a week and it only takes some eight hours, that's bad. So I want to, there's a there's an element that you're racing a bad guy should that thing, like, first of all, you've got alerts that happen all day long. You don't know if they're real bad guys or they're false positives. And if they are a real bad guy, you don't know if it's the kind of bad guy that is actually competent enough to go achieve whatever his objective is in your company. There's that problem too. But once you're there, you need to be able to get there. And the only way to really beat them is either you have a bunch of really smart people, which means you've spent a lot on your payroll to do this, or you're trusting somebody else to do it for you. And and then and that usually means a level of automation, right? So we put a ton of, of thought into how do I give you the ability to feel and control uh, about what kinds of automations you turn on and what you don't without overwhelming you. Because if I go too far down that path, it's like, well, crap. Now, if I'm, there's like a million choices and there's all these levers and buttons and dials. And like, I don't I want to do this because like, I didn't want to get into this business for that particular reason. And if I need to go down this route, I need to hire somebody just to help manage you. And like, don't, we didn't want to do that either. So we, we, we spent a long time trying to find like, what's that happy medium for um, getting in, getting the results I want, but I want to guide you to make these really simple, like these are no brainer decisions. So it's things like, hey, I know it's scary to have a, uh, 
you know, a third party reach out and message your users and ask them about whether they the logged in suspiciously from another place. So let's make it where we just do one a day. You have maybe maybe you have 10 suspicious logins fire in a day, but we only reach out to one. And the very first one, congratulations, is you, Stanley. Did you log in from Jamaica? And you go, no. <laughs> and then we go deal with it. And you go, hey, Stanley, we reset your account. I'm sorry about that. Was it painful? How bad was it? And you're like, I mean, it was, you know, I get it. Somebody stole my credentials and I'm glad we're predicting the company. Like, oh, okay, cool. Well, tomorrow let's move that to two. Let's try two. And then eventually, so we give you like these training wheels to try to, to make it grow with you and your in trust in your business. And that's how you verify, to use your word, Stanley. So, uh, you know, and so we do that on that side. We do it on the containment side. And we just spend a lot of time really thinking about that because if we don't, you don't get the resolution you really need, right? Otherwise, you just get another thing that blinks at you and yells at you. And go back into what I said in the beginning of the live event is about the process. And mm -hmm. if I may, just to kind of summarize, to make, it's really to identify the pattern within the organization. Every organization has different pattern because there's a lot to do with the human behavior within the organization, within the existing staff, within the existing technology, which we are not saying that we're going to uplift everything and throw it away and restart all over again is mm -hmm. to basically what we have been you know what we sell sarah right mm -hmm. security and risk assessment let's assess it let's look at the baseline let's identify what we don't know and then from what we don't know we identify the pattern and this is what why why we're happy with partnering with ysb so we can identify what kind of pattern and how can we change that pattern that using automation tool that it can be one part of the pattern it can be identified and look at the process within or procedures starting from it admin let's look at it on a daily basis weekly basis on a monthly basis yes we see a lot of noise in the beginning on a weekly basis oh my goodness we get all these tickets well, but then eventually after we meeting so many times, then we can identify, you know what, these type of patterns, these type of alert can be addressed by adding another policies and procedures. And mm -hmm. that's how we accomplished the 87 reductions in the first year. Right. It's really to say, oh, you know what, we you know, back in those years, okay, don't forget, this is almost 10 years ago when we started this <laughs> process and building the, this procedure. It's like lots of people going to, um, you know, un, unapproved website, let's just, for example, and I, I'm referencing this as a case study when a four hour global uh, hospital chain, I mean, sorry, hotel chain. So lots of people going to some not approved websites. And then, so we start looking at, you know, the geographic location based on the IP address to eliminate, you know, where they can go and cannot go and then look at the specific website, maybe because it's a marketing team that they need to expanding and that the business development team need to expand another territory. So then we start looking at, how, well, how can we balance it by not restricting too much of it and then, but allow certain department to do pretty much whatever they want, you know, mm -hmm. like the C-suites, right? So based on the behavior, what they need on the business, to look for that pattern and then we build the policies and procedures around that uh, approval process. And actually by six months, we already seen a drastic reduction. And part of the reason why is because the human behavior saw how the SOC team is looking into that kind of web traffic and then say, oh, you know what? We're being watched by the big brother, so we better be careful what we do. And that is part of tying into the security awareness, awareness education. And that changes the behavior of the organization and that help us to achieve that goal. So this is how we did it and back in those years. And now we're focusing more on the automations and putting into the different pieces to identify the pattern, and then we can continue to look at the building blocks, look at each block and part of the, how we addressing the cost efficiency, maybe some of the tool needs to go because now their newer one can replace that and can do better job. And this is why that, you know, I was gonna offer, but you already give, you know, 
the fun Sorry. games are waiting. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> but anyway, no, this is why we, we, we talk about this, you know, uh, um, kind of all the time, because it does change. It does take time to change any organization. And then it tied it back into some of your experiences. We got mid-sized company, which is our kind of our sweet spots, you know, because they cannot afford the seven tools or the seven FTE. But meanwhile, they might need to comply with seven of these type of compliance regulatory <laughs> issues. So again, this is what we are trying to accomplish. So how can do they do it once to address many? Yes. And finding the sweet spots on the resolution, not necessarily that it has to be tool. And, and actually, in fact, go back into the other AI I talked about. No, the uh, tools cannot fix everything. So it needs to have that balance with the other AI augmented intelligence to making sure that we have that safeguard and the guardrail and to look at a GRC from a top-down perspective and then using different types of tools, existing tool including, and tracking the data to go from the bottom up from that perspective to find that sweet spot. Yeah, I, I love that you said pattern. Um, that's something that's really big to us too. Um, one of the, like another example of that is. I know we, you have a lot of great blocks talking about that. That's why yeah. I want to make. Yeah, sure thank you. you, I, I, thank you for the, no, I, I read that all the time because it, you know, it, it inspired me and in how we help to balance between yeah. process and GRC top down and the bottom up from technical perspective to find that sweet spot. And again, our objective is very simple. And I'd like to go back and to talk about is cost justifications. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what cost it is from a business executive point of view. And we are very, you know, we live in a very competitive world in cybersecurity. How can we continue adding value to our customers to make sure that cost justifiable and including our existing yeah. customer? We always find that's my anxiety come in. How can we do better? How can we do better? How mm -hmm. can we do better? So sorry, Tim, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 that's good. So then the, the thing I was going to mention about patterns is, uh, so when we start seeing patterns of life, so like Stanley, you just, you're on this Jamaica. Yeah, I don't know if you knew this or not, but you're going to go to Jamaica on vacation, I guess. <laughs> so you go to you go there and, and, and like, let's say you invite Sean with you. You go and you uh, have this un, unusual login location and we go and we reach out to you and you go, yeah, it's you. And we verify it's really you. And we're like, awesome. That's good. We learn that about you and about your organization. Like, hey, you know what? At least for the next 30 days or so, this is like this is an okay location. So if I see Sean logs in, so you guys are maybe it's not Jamaica, but or maybe it's like you're on a conference in Jamaica. This is gonna be real fun. Well, I mean, but this goes back into your credit card because yeah. I give you a real scenario, yeah. give my audience a real scenario because I yeah. travel back in Asia and back then, yes, I get, you know, I you know in the beginning of their new process, I should say, mm -hmm. or the current process, they stopped my credit card transaction. They forced yeah. me to make a call, you know, overseas. Yeah. But it was embarrassing. It was like, oh, yeah. my credit card don't work. Well, Stanley, your company running out, you know, out of money. You couldn't even afford to pay this dinner bill in front of my client. So that was terrible. But then, of course, later on, they see that I built up this patent. And yeah. that that is why I love your you know, technology yeah, yeah. is because that is what the augmented intelligence should do is to learn from the patent and correct by itself. Yes, in the beginning, it might be a lot of noise, but after you trained it, then it, it becomes let the automation drive itself. 100%. It's like, I, I always like to say, it's like um, we do these cases the way I would work them. So like Stanley, if you or I had infinite time and we could go to every single company and we'd sit there and say, okay, we're going to work this case. This alert came in. Let's, what are we going to do? You'd learn, oh, well, this company's got people here, here and here. Okay. That seems okay. And we, we go handle them and a, a couple of weeks go by and like, oh, here's another one. Oh, I already know this because I've seen it from here. We just put a lot of things together that we um, don't have to necessarily do. Uh, for example, we treat the VIPs differently than we treat other people. So you're a human touch. Right. We we really care about that. That's really important to us. <clears throat> so one of the first things we do when we integrate with you, we we read your directory of whether it's Microsoft or Google, we go pull it all in, we map out you know, job titles and organizations, whatever you have defined in there, and say, okay, these are the VIPs in this company. Um, we'd also like to do the same thing for computing assets. But it's often really hard. I've never seen a company with a really good CMDB, Configuration Management Database, where they're actually tracking all of this. It's a very hard task. But we kind of do what we can. We infer it. So if I see an alert that's coming from 
an endpoint tool, say Sentinel One or Microsoft Defender, and oh, it's the CFO. He's a VIP. Oh, and he's on laptop one, two, three. Well, laptop one, two, three is now in our parlance a high value asset, which means we're not going to automatically contain it because it's important, right? Just like we wouldn't automatically contain and isolate off the network a server because that could be taking your business down. We're going to escalate in those scenarios. We're not going to take action. So we do the same exact thing. And that's how we learn over time. It's learning these patterns of life, learning the patterns of your business but doing it in a way that doesn't require a human to sit here and connect the dots because we've got the logic. We've done this before. So if I see this and I see this, okay, that's a connection. Now, now I'm learning this pattern. And, and which is the part of going back into Sean's case, sorry. And then I'm Sean, sorry. I'm going to jump about a, you know, the Barry of the mouse for the CEO. Yes. Mm -hmm. That, that was kind of the, you know, there's always rules or exceptions to the automations. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the scenario that we have to go through with our client. And in fact, that, you know, of course, they're using one of the big two platform out there. You know, I'm not going to name names. And then, you know, that was kind of the process that we talk about. Well, it's simple for us to flip the switch and kick it on. But is that tool able to give you the preference? that you, you know your executive might want to have a different type of treatment comparing to the rest of the team with that impacting their productivity or even the way they answering the email in particular we talk about like you know spamming and you know as simple as uh, phishing those bec type of attack how do we want to turn on the spam filtering or how vigorous that we need to turn it on and keep it the problem with that, and then I'm going to, Sean, you can chime back in. You know, the problem with that is the, the help desk, the SOC team needs to manage that, you know, basically according to the C-suite's behavior. How would they know that? Nobody going to tell them, you know, certain way to do it. And this is one of the way I like your product is because I can kind of it's gradually escalating it and with the human touch by not on an alert system, but in a Slack, you know, through a Slack channel. Hey, are you in Jamaica? You know, kind of like a light touch, a soft touch. And if they are, then yes, that takes a different route comparing to the zeros and one on or off. So that's just my comment. From kind of building upon what we were just talking about is that we keep talking about automation. And I want to just make it clear, anybody on the technical side, these tools are not getting rid of your job. They're not going to fully replace you. If you're an executive listening to this conversation, you can't get these tools and not have to worry about hiring IT specialists or security specialists. These tools are designed, as Tim was explaining before, to remove these low-level repetitive tasks that people were relied upon to do before that we have automation to do now. And as Stanley has said, you need someone that understands the business and the technical side as augmented intelligence to make decisions for you. So it, it's not necessarily a cost savings by not having to spend money in this area on staffing. You're going to need it. So these tools but are over also, time it will in the you sense will say, because you, you will don't save need to add time. additional people. That's right. And the, the idea that we always look at for tools, Stanley, is the scalability. Is this tool scalable for the organization when we're making the recommendation? Because one of the problems that we've seen in the past is it's not scalable. I've been, as in a previous life, when I was running a company, we got to a point with software, it wasn't scalable. Mm -hmm. And we had to go find a new solution. That's painful in itself to go and find that Very, new solution. Yeah. One thing I wanted to touch on for both of you, uh, Stanley, you've mentioned uh, security and risk assessment, what we call SARA. That's one of the services we do. And Tim, you've talked about uh, WireSpeed and what it does. We see some synergies between the two, the two, the two in what they can do. But I wanted to talk about how does it address regulatory compliance? That is an area that we're starting to get more conversations with people whether it be in the defense industrial base and CMMC, whether they be a publicly traded or publicly oversought company uh, by the SEC, or they just happen to be in one of the 22 states that has data privacy laws now. 
they have to meet certain requirements, regulatory compliance, not just cybersecurity frameworks, not just best practice guidelines that many industries offer, but they're now having to meet these data privacy and cybersecurity laws. How does SARA and WireSpeed meet the regulatory compliance requirements? How does it support them? Do we have another couple hours? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have it, five I mean, minutes. Rabbit hole. Uh, okay, cool. So here, I'm, here, I'm notorious for rabbit holes, Tim. This is a this is a, the gist of it. So it depends on the on the regulatory body, but some almost all regulatory regulatory bodies have a requirement for collecting logs and then doing something about it, monitoring on some some degree. Um, a lot of the, uh, a couple of the bodies you mentioned have uh, like duties to report. So you have a material event. And you have something like the SEC is now saying they want material for publicly traded. I think it's mm -hmm. 72 hours. Right. Uh, the definition of material obviously is that's where your lawyers come in and you can right. fight over that. But um, when those types of events happen, like it's not pleasant, right? So here's the fun thing. You can have an antidote. You can have a little ounce of prevention instead of a pound of cure. You can get detection response in place in front of that so you don't have a material impact. You have a minor infraction where somebody broke in and did something, but they were instantly contained in a matter of a few minutes. And I've got case studies and examples of where we've done that for customers. And they don't become the story in the news. So you don't have the SEC filing. You don't have the, the Privacy Act stuff. You don't have any of that because you avoided it. Obviously, we all want that. Everyone would want that. Right. So, but yes, there's a little bit of both. What do you think, Stanley? Because I think I feel like you're about to. No, 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 no. Keep going, please, because so, I, I I was just going to make it simple and show one slide, if I may. Um, and because, like you said, Tim, you're right on, and it, it takes about another conversation. And we're happy to talk about that more in length. But this is basically one slide that I want to show. So I'm going to pull this up. Um, can you see it? Can everyone? Yes. Know? Okay, so if I can just make it into this. It's a complication that between governance, <laughs> risk, compliance um, from the top down, from the, you know, to answer your question, Sean, is the business executive wants to know what are we doing with the compliance and regulatory issues, right? And also, you know, how are we doing in the performance on our own governance process? And we got to have tools from the bottom up, you know, with the different type of technical tools to capture the data analytic to put that data visualization to work. Now, a part of it is we got an ongoing addressing the operational effectiveness, what we talked about, and then, of course, the cost efficiency for the business executive. So, and tied it into what Tim you're saying is this is over time that it increases on the compliance tethering on the bottom for regulatory. What I address is, well, if we are ongoing doing this type of work, let's make sure that all the evidence or whatever we, our work is working on can be used for evidence purposes. Now, not, not every company needs to comply to regulatory issues. But what we're addressing is all the cyber insurance if they need cyber insurance, because now I'm sure that if you get hacked, then you try to take advantage of your cyber insurance. The insurance company is going to ask you, well, what have you done to mitigate or mitigate this type of cyber risk? Right. So this is mm -hmm. part of the ongoing process to increase operational effectiveness. On the other hand, for the company, like what I talk about, what you know, human behavior, when as your organizational cognizance, which is knowledge and awareness increases, you are more cost efficient because you might need to, you will not need to spend more time to address, you know, all these issues. As we already know in the last five years, everybody knows the term cybersecurity. They might not know what it means. They might know what to do <laughs> what with it, but they heard of it. Even though with, you know, company that don't use this technology, they come to ask me, well, what do you do with cybersecurity? And part of me is I teach small businesses, you know, to enhance them. It might be a, just a you know, one person business, but they come and ask me about, you know, how do I manage cybersecurity? So, you know, this is fine. This is part of our educational process. 
and we love them to join our cyber risk governance groups do a little salesy pitch here so <laughs> i don't have to repeat myself and that's why i love automation and to summarize it and that's why i want to get myself out of this job of educating explaining and you know utilizing wonderful solution like wire speeds you know from the bottom up perspective but at the same time sarah is to translating all these complex com complex you know governance processes risk processes with our ecosystem partners these are the subject matter expertise and going put them into finding this sweet spot i hope this graph makes more sense than what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> because it's time is up anyway so we got five more minutes so i would love to see tim you, you and i as i said that you went from big company walmart largest company in the world and then to the largest pen test company and i'm no pen testing is still a hot topic everybody well we got to do pen test we got to do pen test and and of course that we are also a partner with netspy and what is your difference? And because I'm sure that for our audience that are not technical, they heard of all this terminology and now they, you know, we are introducing a new solution to it. What would be your take? How is difference? How our audience should look at this tools differently? And what should they do to evaluate to make it cost justification for them? Yeah, uh, great, great question. So uh, to me, if you're talking about pen testing and all that, you're, I like to think of things in the timeline. There's a, a terminology that I think it came from military and that sometimes is cringy, uh, called left of boom and right of boom. If you've ever heard this terminology or left of bang, or right of bang. It's also in your blog. It's not, yep, <laughs> I love it. It's on my blog, you're gonna see a whole thing there. Uh, there's an entire, there's actually a security conference uh, called right, right of boom. And it's just meaning like bad thing happens, an explosion. And, you know, like, what did you know before the explosion that you could have seen and prevented it? And that's where like the penetration testing, the, your governance controls, all of that stuff comes in right there up front. How do I pre prevent the bad thing from happening? You can't prevent all bad things. Some bad thing is going to happen. When that bad thing happens, the question is how much time elapses on the right hand side of this that allows that boom to become worse? Maybe it's, I mean, like if you're, you know, maybe it's a, you know, I'm going to take it away from cyber for a second. Instead of an explosion, maybe it's a chemical spill. The sooner you contain that chemical spill, the last people that get exposed to it and what more people are healthy and not sick, right? That sort of thing. But it's the same kind of concept. If I can see a bad thing happen, a bad guy stole an account. Cool. If I get that notice and then if I can go in, this is a real example that happened last week for a client, 221 seconds later, so barely over three minutes, Warspeed closed down the account. And it, after communicating with that user and confirmed, nope, they didn't really log in from that location. Boom, done. Boom happened. So, somehow they stole the credentials. I still don't know how those credentials are stolen. That, that, that happens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the user doesn't remember. However, what those unknowns will always be forever unknowns. What we were able to go do is say, okay, we've contained it. It didn't become a big, bad problem. So you, you need both sides. You need left of boom. You need right of boom. You need before all the bad things, all the prevention stuff. You need the, the response stuff after, or to use your word, you need the, the remediation or resolution side afterwards, right? To make sure you really contain it all in. And just in the terms of cost justification, it comes down to which do you want to pay? Do you want to pay for a ransomware outbreak? Do you want to pay for regulatory fines? Do you want to pay for all of those types of things that can go wrong and bad? Or would you like to pay a little bit and minimize it? And the cool thing is, over the last 10, 15 years, especially the cybersecurity community and industry has figured out how to make this cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And what Wirespeed is it represents the entire next hop. It's a giant leap on how to make it even cheaper than it's ever been before without sacrificing any of the quality. And I would argue it's a better user experience because I've spent a lot of time, it really matters to me, is the user experience. So we're able to go do that in a way that um, makes us make decision. Yeah. As the professional yeah. in this field. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it, 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 we know that the whole industry is heading to, if you don't use automation, but what type of automation, you know, yeah. of course, it's Nest Switch and Wirespeed, nothing else out there. 
So um, <laughs> what type of automations, you know, in this process to help you to find that sweet spot so we can have that balance. So we, we, it, 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 this is why it matters to all the community members. And thank you for our community members. And we almost hitting to the 5,000 mark. I really appreciate that because I think that we want to fix this problem. And we know that has been dragging on for so long. It's not about just selling. But, you know, elevate connaissance. That's the first line in our visions. You know, how can we elevate connaissance? How can we hyper automate our resolutions and then, you know, enable cyber resilience? With that remark, thank you very much, Tim. Really appreciate it. I'm sure you'll be coming back to talk, you know, to dive a little bit deeper from the technical side within our LinkedIn posts and our podcasts, you know, to actually help people to understand how to use your tool now that we introduce it to them so this is something that like of course to, you yeah you can trial I like, was to, right, <laughs> like to take advantage of the trial reach out to us reach out to stanley reach out to me we're happy to get it taken care of for you oh sure. go Thank check out me. tim check out your blog i if highly advise people go go to your blog so what is yeah. your website address it's, please it's wirespeed.co.co not com dot co and then you just go there there's you'll see blog in the top right corner i've got some stuff in there uh and there's it's i try to boil down some of these thoughts that we've talked about there's one out there talking about where does detection content even come from that one probably be a really good one for people that, that have been around in the in the it and governance space but haven't really thought too much about it and then it, we lead you to why we think this is the right solution in terms of where should your money actually go so there's things there like go. that out there that are at, you know it's just Musings from a guy that's been doing this for a long time. Let's put it that way. Yep. And elevate Connison. That's the first step. So find out what we don't know. All right. Thank you, everyone. I Thanks, appreciate guys, your Rory. time. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone in the U.S. and Canada, right? Bye-bye. <laughs>